You're listening to. 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 Conversations with Amber the Fan Girl. You're amazing. Go Amber. Go Amber. You're the best. Hi guys, Amber here. Welcome back to In Conversation with ATF. My guest today is an actress, a voice actress, uh, the voice of, right, okay, you're gonna kill me for saying this, uh, Great Grandma Fran in Rhapsody Street Kids Believe in Santa. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist bringing that off. Um, <laughs> various characters in Spitting Image, the the reboot, um, not the, because we, we had Spitting Image, it was like really famous in the UK. Like right, really the reboot yeah. is in the UK. It's not here in the States. On Britbox. Is it not? I thought it was on Britbox. It, it is, but we don't get it here in the UK. Oh. I mean, we don't hear it get in the US. So oh, when right. I recorded okay. it, I was recording it for the UK. Oh, right. I see. Okay. Um, She was also a Mad TV cast member, just like Phil Lamar, who was also recently on my show as well. And that mm-hmm. reminds me, because on Twitter, someone put a video of you in a Catwoman uh, spoofing Eartha Kit. And I was like, you're literally standing there in front of Static himself, Green Lantern, like years before he did the DC stuff. I'm like, wow. You say it again. <laughs> um, you know, in there's a there's a that's a sketch in Mad TV where you played mm-hmm. Catwoman. You wore right. a Catwoman outfit. You were present right. Earth a kit, and like I was like, because Phil was like talking to you in the scene. I was like, right. You literally did that before he did the DC animated stuff because he was Green Lantern on Justice League and Static and Static Shock. And it's just so cool how it all links together. Sorry, I need to stop Mm -hmm. talking fast. No, it's very cool. No, it is very cool. It is very cool. I tend to talk really And David Herman too. But David Herman left Mad TV pretty early on. He left after the second season. But David Herman does so so many animated shows. He's He's been doing Bob's Burgers for God knows how long and um, King of the Hill. So mm-hmm. yeah, he's very well known in voiceover too, who was also a cast ah, member. Yeah, so cute. cool. My guest has also been the voice of Grandma Shark in Baby Shark's Big, big Show, uh, General Lines for Call of Duty Modern Warfare, um, Amanda Waller in Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League, which is coming out this year. And mm-hmm. I'm quite, I'm, I am buying that. I am pre-ordering my copy because of course, Tara Strong's in it, yep. and. Kevin Conroy, his last out in his Batman. Uh, yeah. We'll talk about, we'll, I know. We'll talk yeah, about that. Yeah, but we'll, my we'll, biggest thing is Seer Junda in Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order and Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Oh, Survivor yes. is coming out this year, and I'm extremely excited. Those games were pretty prolific for me to, to be a Jedi, so. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, we could talk about that as well, of course. Like, we could talk, like, as much as you can because of NDAs and yeah. stuff like that. There so, are certain ones I can, like God of War, I played Gryla and that game came out. It did, it's doing very well. It did very well and it's doing very well still. But also on Nickelodeon, I am the voice of headmistress Bloodgood for Monster High. Monster High, yeah, I did. I, I saw that on your Wikipedia page. I was like, because mm, that is already down on my list. Uh, one final thing my guest has done. She is the current voice of Daisy Duck for the Mickey Mouse Funhouse. Um, I was nearly said the Mickey Mouse franchise, but I was like, no, no, she voiced Daisy in a Mickey Saves Christmas. And um, I was like, mm. so yeah, that's, there's another person who has taken the reins of one of the famous six. Of course, that being, well, let me, I've, I've got to think in my head, Mickey, Minnie, Goofy, Pluto, Daisy, and Donald. Donald. Did I, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. My guest is the lovely Deborah Wilson. Welcome. Hello, Deborah. Hi, welcome to you. Hi. Welcome to my home. <laughs> wow, I, I love I, okay. That couch, I love that couch. I love the paintings, the, the, the ceiling, your chair. Oh my gosh, like wow. Um, where, where, are you, where are you calling from? If you don't mind me asking, I'm calling from Los Angeles. Oh, I am jealous. I'm here in so LA, jealous. Oh my gosh, I was meant to be there this year. <laughs> oh, but, you know, <laughs> well, the year's, only still, one can the year's still early. It's the year is very young still. It's only we haven't even hit February yet. We will in a day or two, but still. It would only be the second month of the year, so you have got eleven more months to get here. Oh, that's my that's my birthday next month as well. So you know, <gasps> I'm just go. Gonna... How lovely! When the twelfth, same as Tara Strong. <laughs> we Aww. share a birthday. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be nineteen. I find that hard to believe, really, because I'm like I was nineteen. Gonna... Mm-hmm. You're young enough to be my daughter. You have it's. Oh, 
I'm so honoured. Like, I was going to say, because I went to the post office today to get my passport, and one was like, a child passport, and my dad's like, no, adult. Oh. <laughs> I was like, I'm trying not to laugh. That's like, hilarious. I'm, okay. like, old enough to be your mom. Well, way older to be your mom. I'd be an older mom if I had you. I would have Aww. to be an older mom because I'm 60. So you're 19. You're going to be 19 and I'm 60. So I would have to be like, yeah, I had her in my, my 50s, my 40s. Yeah, I had her late in life. <laughs> why does she have an accent and why is she white? <sighs> Miracles. <laughs> didn't, even, didn't even need any sperm. Didn't need, even need any sperm. She just, yeah. And she actually came out full grown, which is why I talk like this. <laughs> well i'm flattered deborah thank you i feel i feel very honored i feel very honored i have i consider so many people uh, as mother-like figures to me and you're one of them oh thank you my daughter you're, well, you're welcome mother <laughs> um so deborah okay okay i've got to start off by talking about this because this is the this is one of the main things that inspired me to ask you to be on my show so in Mickey Mouse Funhouse, um, in its current season, seasons two, I think, yeah, you are the new voice of Daisy Duck. And um, wow, I, people have said it's because Tres McNeil stepped down altogether or just for that show or because she was busy. I'm not sure. Yeah. And I, don't, I don't really feel yeah, like asking it's, because I know that's Tress's business. Not no, no, it's, it's, it's pretty public business. Tress McNeil is brilliant. She is still Daisy Duck. She's Daisy Duck for everything else. She is Disney's Daisy Duck. And this was another show that came up and she said, with all the stuff that I do, I just, I, I can't commit to this weekly grind with this one because everything else was weekly for everything she does. She's on The Simpsons from the very beginning. So from The Simpsons, which has prolific been on for 20 years and for all the Daisy Duck stuff and the, and the Disney stuff. And then, and then something else comes up. She, accepted it and said, yes, I'm Daisy. And then she realized it was a weekly grind to sing and to and to do this with all of her fullness of work and, and body of work. She was like, this is a bit much for me. So um, I'm going to, she did the first season and said, I'm gonna step down from this show, not from everything. I'm gonna step down from this show. And then they went on a massive hunt for uh, the next Daisy. Because like, right, we're you. already in production, so we need to, yeah. we've already got one season out, and now that yeah. that season's out, uh, we've got this time in between before we start the next season to just find that Daisy that we're looking for. Yeah, I was going to say, because this reminds me of when uh, Tony Anselmo was Donald Duck for, uh, I think it was, I'm not sure how many things of uh, Roadster Races he did or if he didn't do any. But then, of course, um, because he was busy with like all the projects in Kingdom Hearts and stuff, they got Daniel Ross to step in and do Donald Duck for that show. So yeah, that's a very similar story. Um, yeah. So, and then he uh, came back. So, yeah, so Daniel yeah. Ross had to step down again because it was again. And so if Tress McNeil decides that she wants to to do the show again, or, or she gets freed up, then I'm out. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, wow. This massive hunt uh, happened to find the second voice of Daisy. So how did you, how did you audition? Were you put forward? Did they come to you? How, how did that all happen? Well, it, it's a matter of my agency has a relationship with da with, with Disney and, and, and so many different companies. You know, I've come from a, a huge company called CESD, Cunningham, Escott, Slevin, Doherty. And um, they're very well known across the world, let alone across the country. And so they have Pat Brady, a former agent there who is now retired, has a, a relationship with, with Disney. And they were like, OK, well, I'm going to, you know, I want to pitch Deborah to come in and, and audition for this. And, and I was pitched for it. And they said, OK, here's what the audition is. And originally they wanted me to sound like Tress McNeil and then sing a song. Uh, they gave me uh, these sides. And they gave me Tress's um, voice track. And I realized that it was a challenge. I think that one audition took me three hours just to send it in, just to complete it. Because wow. it was trying to sound exactly like Tress McNeil as Daisy. Not Tress McNeil, but Tress McNeil as Daisy, which is a challenge because I'm trying to sound like two different things at the same time. Yeah. And so I did the singing and I did that. And I went, this is grueling. I don't even know if I'm really interested, but... Um, I'm, I did what I had to do and I like accuracy. So I, I was really looking for technical execution and I wasn't paying attention to character because Tress was already the character. Let me get the technical execution down. 
sent it in and I went, oh, good, because it took me so long. It's It doesn't feel like it's going to be, it wasn't fun. It was accurate and I put my energy there, but it wasn't fun. And so uh, weeks later, I was like, oh, good. I didn't hear back. That's good. You know, it's all good. But I did what I had to do. I left it in the booth. I did my technical execution. And then uh, Pat Brady calls me and says that you have a call back. And believe it or not, I wasn't happy. It was more like oh, more technical execution. And this time it was going to be in studio. Everyone was going to be on Zoom. Yep. So I go in and I do it. And then there's a song and I have to sing the full song now instead of just the piece and the audition. And they're saying, okay, sound like this. Okay, do this. Let's do this. Okay, more trust like this, more like this. You know, and they're not saying trust his name, but they're saying, okay, sound more like, okay, hear that. She's doing this, so do that, do this. And it was just technical execution. It was basically going to a table and saying, okay, you want you want um, tom tomato sauce on the side of that and you want salt and pepper on the side, but you want me to put your pickle on your salad. It was like technical execution. Make sure you get yeah. all this, the, the order down properly and don't forget. That's what it felt like. And so I got through it and it was like, okay. I felt... Like I, I got my orders in and I got my orders in on time and I was a polite and gracious server. And I was there when you wanted more water or tea or coffee or napkins or any or dessert menu. So mm -hmm. I felt I did everything I needed to do. Now I'm going to let it all go again. My technical execution, you know, no matter how much they guided me, I got there. There wasn't anything, no, any beat that I couldn't hit. And I got there. So then I let it go and I went, you know what? I don't think I got it. So I'm going to let that go. And that will be that. But now I'm going to brush my shoulders off and pat myself on the back for another technical aspect of, you know, of what I, what they wanted. Cause it was all technical. And I looked at that yeah. and I said, technical is not necessarily fun because I have to mimic exactly what somebody else did to sound like them, not sound like Daisy Duck, sound like them. Tressa McNeil. So Pat Brady goes, <laughs> All right, they have a final callback. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> She's like, yes, they have a final callback. I went to the final callback and something shifted. It clicked. It was effortless. It was fun. It was joyful. It was amazing. I was bunny hopping around the room because I was having such a good time. I was Aww. dancing around the room as Daisy and myself. And it was this beautiful, perfect moment. It was almost like Daisy Duck and I just let loose. And it was, it wasn't, trust me, it was me and Daisy Duck having a dance and play and being silly together. And Pat Brady, when she retired, there were uh, a, a number of, of amazing voiceover artists that were there and Bill Farmer was there and, and so many amazing people. And I was having a conversation with um, an amazing voice actor and an, a beautiful friend, Kevin Michael Richardson. Uh, if you don't know who's, yeah. Who's so Kevin like, Michael Richardson Kevin. and I were being silly. Whenever we get together, it's always like, oh yeah, we always do these stupid voices. We always approach each other like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> that's how Kevin and that's our language. That's our love language. It's never just, hi, Kevin, how you doing? Yeah, I'm good. It's always like, hey. and I was like, yeah, right. we always have, that's our love language. So we're doing, we're acting silly. We're just silly. Yeah. So we're acting silly and there's someone standing around watching and waiting to talk. And I didn't know if they were waiting to talk to Kevin. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me, I know I'm being silly with Kevin. I will, I'll say, no, I'm going to talk to you. And it was an executive from Disney who said, um, cause I found out I, I booked Daisy. He said, here's what ended up happening. Me and the producers approached Disney and the folks at Disney and said, look, you're asking her to be someone else. She's, you're asking her to execute, you know, a voice like someone else, but is Tress McNeil Daisy Duck? You know how many ta Daisy Ducks we've has, it, it had? Is Tress McNeil Daisy Duck? Or is Daisy Duck a Disney character? And so you're not asking her to bring anything new to the table. You're asking her to repeat it because you started the season instead of doing a Daisy Duck. What is Daisy Duck? Who, who is Daisy Duck? Can't anybody be Daisy Duck? But you're asking her to be Tress McNeil. And I think 
it's pushing in the wrong direction because now, you know, every week you've got to force her to be to Tress McNeil. And she's not bringing anything to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and every time I would finish in each audition, I would go, how's that? How's that? How's that? So it was never a joy. It was just a matter of, did I get it right? Did I get it right? Did I get it right? Is that what you like? Is that what you want? You know, and it was felt like a, a servitude place, which is why it wasn't fun. And I believe in servitude, but not when it's a matter of I bring nothing to the table, offer nothing, because then what is the point of, of, of being in this business if you have nothing to offer except having them tell you what to do and you execute it perfectly, but you're being told what to do, then the, even the execution is not fun anymore. And so um, you can still be you and bring you to the table and give everybody what they want. And then in the process, you get a chance to make choices. And in the process, you get a chance to give, uh, make offers to, what about this and what about this? You feel like you're involved in the process. Yeah. And when you're just serving in that regard, just that regard alone, you're not involved in the creative process at all. It has nothing to do with you. And so the reason the last and the third final audition was like, I took off, was because they got a chance to see my personality, feel my personality, hear my personality in Daisy and allow Daisy Duck to be Daisy Duck instead of it has to be Tress McNeil. Because Tress McNeil have, and I have the same voice print, but mine is slightly different because I made Daisy a little bit sassier, a little bit more fun, a little bit more playful. And they like, we like that for her. We, we actually like that for Daisy because now it's giving Daisy more of a personality. She, it's making Daisy stand out a little more with the gang as opposed to blend in. And the choices that I made were cuter and and and, and in terms of a Daisy thing and um, sillier and a little bit more fun. So I, I rode on Tress McNeil's prolific and amazing coattails and built on her foundation to make Daisy was just a little different, took everything that Tress did and said, Tress is this beautiful vase. And so now I'm gonna take that vase and I'm just going to keep the shape, but I'm going to bring that clay out a little bit more. So it's got a spigot or spout or spigot, spout. And then I'm gonna take that same shape and I'm gonna add more clay to it to make a handle. So I took this beautiful vase, left the shape. So you look at it and go like, that could have been a vase or that's a vase and you go, yes. But I added, a spigot to it or, or a spout to it and then put a handle, you go, oh, but that's also a picture. Yes. So is it a vase or a picture? Yes. And that's how Daisy Duck came to be. Oh my God, that is such a really good story. Cause I remember I heard the clip of you as Daisy and I actually thought it was Tress to be fair. Cause no one said like, I, I, I didn't know that her voice had changed until someone you'd revealed it on an interview it was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. And um, it says on your, um, oh, where is this? It? it said something on your Wikipedia that I can't find right now, but I can't. Uh, Wikipedia is, is nine times out of 10. Uh, I won't say nine times out of 10. I would say Wikipedia four times out of 10 is incorrect or they, it's, or inaccurate. I won't say it's not correct, but it's inaccurate. So what does it say? I'm interested because I don't go to really Wikipedia to see my stuff. Here it is. Um, uh, in the second season of Mickey Mouse Fun House, well, this is on the Daisy Duck page. Uh, McNeil was replaced by Deborah Wilson as McNeil was uninterested in continuing the series. Wilson, the first African American performer of Daisy, also voiced the character in the holiday special Mickey Saves Christmas. That's true. That so is true. It... And it's, it was small and simple. Yes, I'm the first Black Daisy Duck. For Daisy. How does it feel <laughs> to be the first uh, African American before a voice of Daisy Duck? It, it's it's my thing is this if I keep looking at that then I'm keeping looking at myself as a black woman and if I look at myself as a black woman then I know I don't I'm not allowing myself to transform into all those things that I do do that won't that don't require it it doesn't request and require me to show up to be black you feel me and mm -hmm. so uh it, it my only you know thing is that it, it's wonderful to be a first of something but then I have to let that go yeah. because what if the next Daisy Duck is Latina or Latinx what if the next Daisy Duck is Asian, you know? And so it's, it's, it's great to be able to, to have Disney say we are more inclusive and it doesn't matter what color you are, it's your voice that counts. It's how we feel that counts. It's the essence of Daisy that counts. And then color has nothing to do with it anymore. So I don't always wanna make it about color because 
um, Daisy Duck is a duck. Yeah. And Daisy Duck is best friends with Minnie. And 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 she is she her 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 boyfriend or her partner is Donald. And so those are the things are that are more important to take precedence. So for that great and prolific moment for that statement to be I am the first woman of color to voice Daisy is great. But there will be others after me who will do that and blaze a trail for their culture. Um, and so I hold on to it very lightly because it will be important one day to pass that baton. Beautifully said, Barbara. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, um... And there are a couple of things that are, that are firsts for me um, and oh. firsts for African-Americans with Disney. At uh, Disney Disneyland in Anaheim, California, the yeah. Jungle Cruise attraction had on, on their queue has a 1940s radio voice that's been there prolifically since since Jungle Cruise opened. And uh, it, it uh, that voice, while you're in the queue, you get a chance to hear 1940s music and this radio personality comes on in his 1940s radio voice. His name is Albert Awal. And this year, Disney, last year, Disney said, okay, there are certain things that are politically incorrect on this ride and are racist. So we're going to shut down the ride. We're going to change those things, um, enhance them to be friendlier and more inclusive. But let's change the narrative as well with the radio cue because the radio cue is all over the place. And they said, let's say that Albert Abel, A. Wall went off into the jungle on another adventure. After all these years, he, 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 he just, he got that wanderlust and decided that he wants to go back into an adventure. And he leaves the radio station in the capable hands of his sister. And thus, ladies and gentlemen, Skipper Missy came out. Yes, darling, I'm Skipper Missy. That was not the care, twist I was I mean, expecting. Thank you. And then when you think of when you think of um, 1940s radio voices, you certainly don't think of black people. You don't think of African Americans. The 1940s, you think of voices like this. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, how are you? Oh, yes, English. I'm Skipper Missy. Here's what's happening in the jungle today, ladies and gentlemen. Did you know? You know. Wow. Wow. And to my brother, Albert, Alvy, wherever you are. So, um, and they didn't care that I was black. They just wanted to hear and feel like I was really his sister. And that I really was taking over the station. That's all they cared about. You know, no one said, okay, well, we don't want a black person or a black person can't do a 1940s radio voice. It was just a matter of, can you be his sister? Can you make us feel like you're his sister? That you love him and that you are like him and you're taking over the station um, to let him know that, you know, he's leaving the radio station in capable hands. He, he's entrusted it to you and you are not going to let him down. That's all we want to hear. That's all we want to feel. We want to believe in that narrative that it's real. And I said, OK. And I did that. And, and 1940s radio voices are something I love to do anyway. Um, or, or just vo voices from the 40s, from all the old movies I used to watch. Betty Davis and stuff. So um, Catherine Hepburn. So I ended up booking it. So I'm also the first woman because it was always a man. And that was always Disney's thing. It was always man driven in, in a lot of the announcements. And then my next one, <laughs> which was even for me more prolific at Disney World in Orlando, the monorail system has always been voiced by Tom Kane and a few other men. Mm -hmm. And I'm the first monorail captain for the entire system uh, that runs through all the parks in Disney World uh, Orlando. It hasn't been installed yet. It was supposed to be, but there's some, I don't know if it's a technical thing or if it's a political thing or if it's, you know, corporate thing. It hasn't been installed yet. It was supposed to be, but it hasn't been installed yet. And I asked, I said, well, have they changed their mind and gone with a man? Because so many park goers who go every year, this is their Mecca. They, they're, they're, you know, they're Disney fanatics. They have park season holder tickets. Are, do you think it would be too uncomfortable for them to have a woman's voice? And he said, no, that's not it at all. <laughs> they loved you and they loved what you did because all the people from Florida, I was at Disney Imagineering here in Glendale, California, and they all had to be on Zoom 
to listen in to the entire session uh, sessions because there were a number of sessions that were three to four hours at a time. So I think I, I think I recorded it in, in 12, four uh, or three 12 hour sessions or four three hour sessions. Either way, it was like about anywhere between 12 and 16 hours of recording it. And um, yeah, it was a, a massive, a massive. Um, yeah, I just can't tell you how massive it was to book something like that. It was extremely mm. massive. And now, so, and you can go to YouTube and see this. Mm -hmm. It is the 100th anniversary of Walt Disney. Oh, and yay. they have at California Adventure, they have a water show, which is also a light show called World of Color One. And I'm the announcer of that. And someone sent my agent, the, the person who hired me at Disney, saw it on YouTube. Send it to my agent who sent it to me. So you can see it on YouTube. It's someone taped from their phone the entire show, which is a 30 minute show at the end of the night because they wanted to wait until it becomes dusk and a little bit dark. And it's called World of Color One. And I do the narration at the beginning and at the end of the show. That one, had a, I had a huge breakdown because when I finished recording it and then went back in for a pickup session for extra lines or we're gonna change this or we want a different read and take on this, at the end of it, they said, how did, and they, they were like, oh, because at the end of the day, my, my thing is this, and I teach, I coach voiceover. And at the end of the day, I always tell people, they don't want to hear you. They want to feel you. They want to feel you. They don't want to hear you. They want to feel you. Yeah. And so the reason I put every fiber of my being into it is because it meant so much that 100 years ago, when this was an idea in Walt Disney's head, and it began to build into this major part to bring joy and to bring smiles, it wasn't necessarily an inclusive all around concept. And so to watch the people who are carrying on his legacy, who are now getting a chance to see themselves mm -hmm. in, the Disney world, meaning the universe of it all. And they're people of color who always thought that they could dream big, realize that they are passing the baton on to little children who are dreaming big because now they're making sure that when they open that door, there are people that look like them. Um, and so you have Pocahontas who has dark skin uh, all the characters in Encanto who have brown and dark skin. You have now the live action Little Mermaid who is a woman of color. You had Disney's The Princess and the Frog. So it was an African-American marrying um, an East Indian or Middle Eastern prince. And all of these things that are coming to light are letting all the other people who 50 years ago, 60 years ago were or felt that they were not really included. You can go, but it really wasn't in inclusive. And to have this inclusive moment doing this narration is all about the color of Walt Disney, all these beautiful bright colors of Fantasia and color itself, but the underlying current, which is even greater than that, is the color of each and every human being on the planet and that you are included and that the change in the world begins with you. The change in the world, meaning that you are important, you are valuable, you are valid. And here at Disney, this is our homage to Walter Disney and everything that he created. However, his homage has gone beyond that. And we have created a beacon out of that to make it inclusive for everyone to be a part of that world. He may not have thought about it, but we are taking his legacy and trailblazing with it. And so as I'm telling them that, you know, to be the first, a woman of color to be able to do this person, you know, this world of color. And I just broke down crying. I just, I lost it. I just couldn't handle it anymore because just doing the lines meant everything to me. And at one point I said, I need to stop. And I just wanted to look at the studio that I was in, the house that Walt built and look at it and know that this reality is here. 
from a little girl in New York City who never dreamed that big to where I'm not breaking the glass ceiling. Disney is busting it themselves for me to go through. It was powerful and cathartic and emotional and I couldn't handle it anymore. I just, I just broke down crying. I just bawled my head off in the studio saying what an honor and what a gift that um, I'm trusted, entrusted with this, that you trust my, my voice, you trust my emotions, that you're asking me to be everything that I am to do this. Not just a voice, you're not asking for my voice, you want to feel it. And you're entrusting everything that I am and everything that I feel to help tell the story of Walt Disney for a prolific 100 years. And it's just, yeah, it's a big deal. It's huge. So you can see the opening clip. They, they have the whole 30 minute show, but you can see at, at the beginning, you'll be able to hear my voice doing that. And it's just, yeah, I'm very proud of that as well. Oh, that's so wonderful, Deborah. Oh, I'm gonna have to look that up now. You've now inspired me. I just wanna, you know, look it up, take a look. Uh, did you say uh, Disneyland World of Color? It's, it's, a, it's a California, it's a Disney California adventure. Found it. And it's curl, it's called World of Color. One, Here and it's on, um, it's on YouTube, World of Color One. And someone shot it in high definition on their phone. I think I found it. I might have found it. You have to bear with me. Let me just uh, try and uh, show a few tabs. There we go. Let's share my screen. Uh, That's it. Is this the one? This is it. That looks really beautiful. Oh my gosh. Will this only be playing this year? It'll be playing for at least 18 months for this anniversary. Oh, oh well, that's good. That's, that's good, because then I'll be able to see it when I go. So, because I am... My greatest reward is to have the... the oh, these are like, like little flashbacks. What I've done all these years, that, that is a great reward. No, no, keep back. You can go back, go back. What? Because I'm right after his voice. You'll hear it. You'll just hear the very beginning of it. One man, one dream. 100 years ago, Walt Disney set ripples of happiness and imagination in motion. He showed us how little ripples can become great waves. Oh it my. just takes one. Oh my God. Gosh, yeah. I might get copyright for playing that song, so I'm gonna quickly stop it there before someone yeah. uh, tries to boom my video. Nope, you can't use that. But that is so cool. Yeah, because like the incredible coaster in the background, the big Ferris wheel, and just all these. How much work they've got to that's got to go of, into it, not just for the voiceover element of it, but also like the oh yeah, stuff, like, it's all... intensive, and and not only that, but to wow. have it timed. You know, I mean, it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Disney Imagineering is. There are no words for what everyone who works at Disney does. There are no words. Yes, there are. They're magicians, each and every one of them. They're magicians. They create magic. Without them, we wouldn't feel the way we feel. We feel the way we feel because of them. They're, they're, they're magicians. And it's because each and every one of them knew that they were magicians as children and never got the validation. And Disney, Disney supported that validation. You know, yeah. or or they did get the validation which led them to Disney and said, This is my next, this is my next stop on this train, this magic train. And Disney said, Well, when you open the doors, you're not gonna have to walk to find us. As soon as you open the doors, like the monorail, you're already home. Yeah. Oh, I've just had a look. Oh, I've had a look in the and, um apparently the who the the, the woman who sings that show is uh, Lauren Allred, who was from The Greatest Showman. She was actually on Britain's Got Talent. I think last year in the UK, she got to the semi. Wow. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was going to say, because, yeah, I thought I did recognise her name. I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, Speaking of Disney, okay, I've got to ask this, because this question's been floating around my head for a little while, and I was like, do I ask this? Do I not? I don't... I yeah, don't no, know. ask. Okay. Um, well, considering you've worked on, uh, like, Mickey Mouse Fun House, and you've been to, like, uh, like screenings of it, by any chance, have you ever worked with uh, Corey Burton? Or, like, met him or, you know, seen him? I don't recall. What has he done? Uh, he is uh, 
Yeah, actually, I'm trying to think. It was Dale and Chip and Dale. Um, Ludwig von Drake um, for Biggie Mouse Fun House. Okay. Um, We've never worked together because a lot of, most of the times, everyone is recording separately. So we don't, we don't work together like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't recall meeting him. I'd have to see his face. Because again, when I record, I'm in, I'm out. I'm in and I'm out. And it's, it's one person at a time. And some people are on Zoom. Yeah. You know, when they record because they're not in California. Yeah. Not everyone is here in California that records on the show, believe it or not. Really? Mm -hmm. Hmm. I, I didn't know. I just presumed everyone was in like California, Los Angeles when they're doing the show. Like, so, wow. I didn't Most realize. are, but there are some that aren't. Wow. I didn't know that. Wow. Thank you for telling me that. I was, because I was always interested and in wondering. Yeah. John Stamos from Full House. Do you remember this house show, Full House? Yeah. He's, he's on Mickey Mouse Fun House as well. He plays Captain Salty Bones. Oh, yeah. I think I did see something like uh, to do with um, him being on it. Yeah. Wow. Where, where does he record from? I think he goes to studio because it's in Burbank. So it's centrally located in oh. Los Angeles enough for people who are living in L.A. To, to go to the studio. They prefer people to go to the studio because the sound of and the quality of the recording is they want to keep it matching. Everybody's recording matching when they when they actually put it into the, the animation. Yeah, I see. Wow, because yeah, well, I've always wanted to visit the sound studios in a uh, Los Angeles, like Salami Studios and everything like that. But I don't think they do tours or are open to the public. It's just, it's just yeah, because you know why they're just studios. So when you go, you're like, this isn't that prolific. It's just right. But what makes it so great is all the stuff that's been recorded there. And exactly, if there are recording sessions going in. You never know who's walking in. You're like, oh my god, that's oh my god, that's oh my god. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, because okay, I've yeah. done that before. I've sat, I've, I've, I, I, I've sat there, and all of a sudden, I go, "Oh my God, that's Matthew Lillard!" Oh, that's, oh, that's, you know, and you know, people, and at one point, it was like Laura Dern, it's like, goddess. I just have to stop you. I have to, mm. I had to stop Laura Dern. I was like, oh, and she's like, thank you, you're so sweet. Yeah, <laughs> she's an amazing actress. If you don't know, Laura Dern is genius. You know, who Laura Dern is. The name sounds familiar. Did you ever see a little film? Oh, it was no big deal called Jurassic Park. Uh, I haven't watched it, but I've, of course, heard of it. Or oh, okay. Anyway, Laura Dern Sorry. is a brilliant actress. She's done so much more than that. But I think for someone your age, you might know her from like something action-y and that's popular like, like that. But she's a great uh. actor. And so were her parents. Oh, yes, wow. her parents were, were very, very, very well-known A-list Hollywood actors. Ah, oh, wow. Once in the family. I see. Who, who, were, who were her parents? Um, her father was Bruce Dern. Yeah. Oh, he's still alive, though. And her mother is, oh, I can't think of her name. It's, it's I have a short-term memory loss. And uh, I can't think of her mother's name. It'll come to me. I'll look it up and it'll come to me. Uh, 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 Laura Dern, D E R N. Uh, say, oh, hang on, hang on a minute. Wait a second. Uh, they, 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 Diane Ladd. Diane Ladd, thank you. Diane Ladd, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, that's wow. So, I see, it runs in the family, I suppose. That's yes, really cool. And the parents oh, are brilliant, and so Laura's oh. brilliant too. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, well, she was born on February 10th. Oh, I love it when people are born close to my birthday. I think it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, hey, you look, you're, you're, you're like my birthday neighbor. <laughs> when I see people born <laughs> my the birthday neighbor. 11th, really 13th. <laughs> yeah, because I've, 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 I think I met um someone who was born on February 11th. I was like, my birthday neighbor, I was born on the 12th. <laughs> um, that, it was so cool because um, I think like at one time, um. I, I know I knew someone whose best friend was born the day after them in the same year and their mums like knew each other when they were in the hospital. So oh. like they've known each other like since literally when they were born. I'm like, that's actually really cool. Very, wow. very cool. That is a mm. very powerful connection. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a shame I can't maintain friendships like that with because with my autism, I have I'm autistic. Um, friendships is are really hard for me to maintain as well as make friends. You know, and I, I know it's see, I I seem like really professional in these interviews, but like in person, I'm just a nervous wreck. I find it really hard mm-hmm. to talk to people, and it's just that's why I do these interviews because it helps me talk to people a lot more. I interview people who have done a lot for my childhood as well as you know just like shows video games and stuff i like so that's pretty much why i i i I do these sort of things yeah and um uh with that i'd like to um talk to you about a future project coming up which is of course um suicide squad kill the justice league if you can talk about it that is i know yeah i can that'll take it seems like it'll take forever to make because i'm always in studio i was just in studio two weeks ago working on it still with more dialogue and that's because they're going to do seasons uh video games now um as a player you may know this are are, it just doesn't end um and then you wait years sometimes now they're doing seasons so it's like this is the end of this season it's almost like large massive episodes essentially yeah and so we've been working on different various seasons with different incarnations of metahumans coming in to be a part of the suicide squad in the future so it's been massive, but it's a great role. And uh, this is my third turn as Amanda Waller in a project. There are, I had three Amanda Wallers in a project. This is not my first. This is actually my second. And I have a third one that I just finished for for an animated series. Who's that on the so, windowsill back where? <laughs> I see, I see where? a little uh, other shoulder. A, a little little puppy on on, on that's on my the back lucy of your... oh lucy come say hi she is miniature pincher and and chihuahua mix oh she's adorable can you say hi hello oh my gosh i love it when people bring their pets on the show it's just like so freaking wholesome like, yeah oh. i've got i've got fish i've got tarantulas and i have a snake wow i've got 10 tarantulas 10 tarantulas i have 10 tarantulas look, look. that is so cool okay oh she is adorable yes that's lucy but yeah i've got um I've always loved exotics. Um, So I've had tarantulas, scorpions, hissing cockroaches, um, walking sticks, um, Mm -hmm. crested gecko, morning geckos, fish. You've had a chameleon. Sorry, I have to bear with me. Uh, Have you ever had had a a couple of snakes? But I finally got a snake after a decade after not having a snake for a while. I I wanted another snake. I got a little venomous snake. Ooh, is that a famous? Western hog, yes. And there are hognose snakes, I think. No, I think they only span um, the northwest and the southwest of the United States. Are uh, hognose snakes. They've got a little pitch nose that goes up because they dig and they like to bury themselves. And they also uh, play dead. They're the Daniel Day Lewis of faking their deaths. Wow. Yeah, that they fake their deaths. So cool. Yeah, because they're so small, uh, they don't grow very huge. They grow fat, more like vipers. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, oh, so they, they're short, but they grow kind of wide. Uh, and mm-hmm. the males usually grow about two feet. That's it. I wanted I Is wanted a small snake because I've had I've had boas and I've had pythons that grow big, but I wanted something that was going to be small uh, or smaller. So this one is the smallest that I can think of uh, from for me, and it grows two feet. The males grow about two feet. The females grow about two and a half. Um, and so I have the space for him, and it's perfect for him. And he's still a baby. I got him when he was, I don't know, weeks old, maybe a month, maybe. Um, yeah, and I love him. His name is Rocky, and he's got a little pitch Rocky. nose that goes up and he buries himself. And the fangs, these are called rear-fanged colubrids. And the fangs are in the back. So when they grab something, it's still alive. Yeah. And as he's pulling it in, the fangs in the back hit. 
just like boom, oh, bangs in the back wall. Right. As he's chewing it, it goes back and she pulls it in and goes back. And then, yeah, that's, that's how the venom gets injected. That's so cool. Wow. Wow. I, 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 I like, you know, when people say, oh, they've got cats, they've got, <clears throat> excuse me, dogs. Like, I wouldn't expect like tarantulas or like, you know, like uh, uh, re reptiles and stuff like that. So that is really cool. Thank you for sharing yeah. that, Barbara. I love yeah, the little, absolutely. Uh, little lizards. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. This year I'm scorpion. I'm no scorpions anymore. I had two and I let them go. I rehoused them um, oh. to someone I entrust and love. Um, but I've had some really amazing, I've had at least 18, 11, anywhere between 11 and 18 different wow. scorpions. And I've watched them have, give birth and, um, wow. and babies on their back. And so, yeah, <laughs> it's really cool. It's uh, really cool. So but it became a little bit much. And I was like, you know what? I just want to stick with my tarantulas and all females because my females can live anywhere from 20 to 35 years. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Sorry. My phone just, just kind of like, no worries. Off there. So hopefully... <laughs> They'll live as long as I, you know, because by the time I'm 80, they should be, you know, by 85, most of them will probably go by by 90. They're all gone. So at least I, when I can say when I'm 90 years old, when I say when I'm 90 years old, I'll still be able to say I had them. Look at these tattoos. <laughs> I had them for so long. <laughs> tattoos and, and, and reptiles and everything. I'm cool. Hand me that pudding. No, I'm going to take my teeth out for that. Hand me my pudding. Go on, Grandma. Let's get you to yeah. bed. <laughs> Who wants to get in a hot tub with me? I know. I got a lot of skin there. No muscles anymore, but lots of skin. Who wants to get in a hot tub? I'm practically soup in here. Come on, people. Throw in some vegetables. <laughs> oh my 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 cheeks have been smiling like i saw which <laughs> and i'm just like oh god just like oh my gosh like oh i rest them but then i look really serious and i look like i'm not enjoying myself when i smell but like, <laughs> I, 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 that's the problem of like you know like how do you how do you how do you work around that <laughs> it's really weird um you don't have to work around it you just have to enjoy it yeah don't work yeah. around it i'm like oh Be it's in so it. hard. i'm smiling <laughs> yeah <laughs> So back to, to suicide. Indeed. So back to Suicide Squad. Um, mm -hmm. of course you said it was different episodes and stuff, but there is one uh, topic I've got to bring up. Well, of course, at the Game Awards when it was a thing, they think the release date and stuff. And then we saw Batman and out came Kevin Conroy's voice, and it just said on the screen, Thank you, Kevin. And people have said that this is his last outing as Batman. And um I I don't think that's the case because I know Cape Crusader's being made for HBO Max and he is listed to be in that, but I don't know which one's getting... I don't think... Okay, I don't think you know then. You I know why know he's what... not you, Why he's not doing Batman anymore. I know. That's why I brought okay. him up. Okay. Of course. Of course I know because I, yeah. I actually met him last year and... um. After I met him, I, I got into a really big Batman phase. I binge watched the animated series. I watched everything. I was like, okay, Kevin, you've got to be on my podcast. Uh, unfortunately, that, that never came to be. And the day I found out that he passed away was just one of the hardest days of my life because that man had carried me as Bruce Wayne through my tough college days, uh, my, my down days, you know, just anything to do with that. So, yeah, his last out and his Batman. Have you ever... In, did you ever get, get to speak to him or meet him at all, may I ask? No, because all of our stuff was recorded separately. Everything for that, is, and, and especially you're talking like the last three years of the pandemic, you know, it was a, a challenge for, and, you know, we don't really record together. That kind of went the way, and I'm not saying it won't happen again, because I have been in recording sessions for other video games where we've had group sessions for, for mm. um, various dialogues. And that's happened three to four times. And that's been amazing with, with people like, and I'm, I know you know who Fred Tattashore is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, podcast. yeah, Freddie Tattashore, who is my buddy and um, someone I love so dearly. Yeah, we're very close. But other than that, with pro, pro, uh, COVID protocol set up, it, it took those three years because it's here it is the third going into the fourth year of that that finally that group thing could happen, but it was necessary for the, uh, another game that we're working on for Blizzard. And so um, 
when it comes to the individual dialogue or the individual stuff, people just do it individually. They can do it from their home studio or if their home studio is efficient enough and, and has the same quality of sound as a studio, uh, they come in to record. So I've, I've never met him, but I know. And for me, I know because I'm older, I know Kevin Conroy as an actor, stage and screen. So how fantastic that so many people from the stage and screen can carry their acting skills with their voice into something else. But look at, I, I, um, I'm going to challenge you to continue to look at Kevin Conroy's work as an actor on camera. Oh, trust me, I have. I have. Okay. He, did, he did Line of Duty, or was it Tour of Duty? It was from what? I'm getting confused because there is a show in the UK that is called uh, that is called Line of Duty. So you'll have to excuse me. I said the wrong name. Uh, Tour of Duty. It was a soldier show. He did Tour of Duty. Um, he did uh, Rachel Gunn, MD. I think that, that that's probably the wrong initials at the end. Um, and he did a, a few more. He nearly got the lead part in Wings, which actually went to Tim Daly, his future Batman Superman star. He went on to voice Superman. Um, and he's done a, a few other things as well that I have seen on his showreel, as well as like his Shakespeare acting and stuff like that. And I know like he went yeah. to uh, Juilliard and he was roommates with Christopher Reeve and Robin Williams. So yeah. yeah. That's, but that's... if you, but right, I, that's his background, but check out his film work. So. What I'm doing is I'm offering you to check out his film work, not just okay. his resume. Yeah. Okay. And get a chance to really see the man because you hear his voice and that's really, and it's wonderful that it moves you, but watch his film work and tell them again, because I'm old school and I'm older than you. So I know Kevin Conroy, not as Batman. My jump into him as, as an actor. Yeah. You know, that's how I knew Kevin Conroy and his work. Yeah. Yeah, and um, he's such a, a great guy. And I bet I barely met him. I only really met him like for, for like a minute. And I'm really sad that I didn't get to spend a lot of time with him, but I did and I am I, I I'm happy. I'm I'm happy with the life that he had and you know, he had he had he had the greatest fans and he had the greatest work colleagues and now he's 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 still Batman in a few projects now even after he's gone it's poignant it it does bring a tear to your eye and it's starting to bring yeah. tears to my eyes as well because I still especially get especially knowing he was the only that he was the only bad he, he, he always will we might as well just retire Batman now there is no more Batman. <laughs> you're making me cry now <laughs> I always get really emotional talking about Kevin because of like how much of an impact he had on my life it was mm. very it was a very short a very short uh, span because I met him in April and he passed away in November. But that part, just over obsessing over the animated Batman series. Kevin, thank you. I don't know where you are now, but thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I can't wait to play that uh, new Suicide Squad game. Definitely. Because, yes. because. And also, don't forget also, hopefully this will uh, allow you to uh, allow Kevin to pass the baton in that same game and in, in especially Batman the animated series you also yeah. have Mark Hamill as the Joker yeah and Mark isn't going to be doing the Joker anymore I know uh, yeah he said without without Kevin there's no Batman that's he's officially he's officially put down his microphone that's that's the that's the end of the the dynamic duo that's 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 it it's it's very hard to it's... But he also works a lot, you know, and I think the one thing I love about Mark Hamill and the next time we do this, because it's a longer story, I did a Star Wars podcast yesterday and I talked about how I used really? the force to rule Mark Hamill into my life. And it's oh. a pretty amazing and prolific story. And that's a story for another time. But um, Mark Hamill is gracious and kind and lovely and open and creative. And he still has the, the heart of the most enthusiastic person who still sees the wonder and the joy in life. Um, he's kind, he's compassionate, he's creative, he's fun, he's energy, um, and he's care. And um, he's respect and he's every wonderful thing that a human being will bring to their work because that's who he is. And to decide that he's no longer Joker says a lot about 
the person that he is, the respect yeah. and the reverie that he has, um, and and the fact that he doesn't need that money. It's more about that holding that sacred space sacred by discontinuing it, by honoring that space and Kevin Conroy by discontinuing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a beautiful space that he holds. I I adore him and um I miss seeing him. We've worked on a couple of things together and I miss seeing him. Other than Mad TV, I miss seeing him. It was really lovely. And I'm not on any yeah. social media at all. So when it was my birthday, uh Phil Lamar, who knows I'm not on social media, um will take every birthday message on social media and then give it to me. Oh. Phil Lamar is just an amazing human being. I know. I've just had him on my podcast. We had such being. a really good time. Um, He's an amazing oh. human being. The world is a better place for having him do what he does in it. He really is. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I really love him. I really love him. We spent all those years on Mad TV. And we, we with all the work and all the personal stuff, I think we've grown out of that. And as we've grown out of that, we have, I've watched him go from dating to engage, to marry, to children who are grown, um, to our gray hairs, not mine, not so much if they're there, but it's just that I, I shave my head and always wear a, a clean head. And just to see us together like that, and uh, it's just been really wonderful. And we have not, we've been ships that pass in the night when it comes to work. All the years that we've been working, we have not worked together. Uh -huh. And when I do see him, it's always a personal occasion. And the last occasion I physically saw him was at Alex Borstein, uh, Alex Borstein's son's bar mitzvah. Mm -hmm. And I got a chance to see him there. Oh. You know, Al, in case you don't know Alex Borstein's work, I think you do, from Family Guy. Wowish. <laughs> and many other rock. things. And a two-time two -time Emmy winner for The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Wow. She's on a series wow. called The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and she won two Emmys back-to-back -back for Best Supporting Actress. Wow. Two years in a row. Oh, my gosh. Wow, I, I need to try and get Alex on my podcast now. You've inspired me. You fueled me to get her on now. Oh my god! <laughs> um, I've had a look at um Kevin Conroy's resume. He was in Chain of Desire. He was he did of course he did like Batman, Mask of the Phantasm, and everything. And he did uh, shows like uh, Dynasty, Rachel Gunn, RN. Yeah, that's the one. Um, O'Hara. Oh my gosh yeah he did a lot of things search for tomorrow wow and then search for tomorrow then... was our what we call our soap opera our stories ah. you know like you, yeah um you had a a, a show but yours was a, a a nighttime so um i can't think of it it's prolific and i think it i don't know it's still on it's been on for 30 40 years something yeah. street or coronation street no it's not straight then. You, what's your big nighttime drama? EastEnders. Like, EastEnders. Okay, EastEnders is sort of like a drama. We had the same thing during the day and they were called soap operas. And so uh, soap operas during the day, ed end of Edge of Tomorrow was a, you said Edge of Tomorrow or End of Tomorrow? Uh, search for Tomorrow. Search for Tomorrow was a soap opera. Uh, yeah, In other words, yeah, I've, uh, each day had a different episode that left to a cliffhanger, left to a cliffhanger. Yeah. Who's sleeping with who, who had whose baby, who's doing each other wrong, who's undercutting, all of those mm. things. Who's plotting <laughs> and so that was a soap opera for a very, very long time during the day. We would call those the soaps. Oh, that's cool. I'll tell you that now. Wow. Okay. Yeah, because we have like EastEnders, Coronation Street, Emmerdale, Doctors, Casualty, Hollyoaks, you know. And I don't even watch soap opera. That's, uh, that's, that's <laughs> the one thing. Like, I just know all these because, like, I know people. Because my drama teacher at college was in, like, all of those. Like, she was a regular in Hollyoaks. And then she did uh, Emmerdale and Coronation Street. I'm like, I want a career like that. Why well, couldn't yeah. you give me some tips? I'm like, yeah, I'm just always nagging her when I see her in college. Miss, miss, can you just tell me how you did this, how you did that and stuff? And I'm like, oh my gosh, she's probably fed up with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> or loves you because you're you're reminding her 
of all her great body of work. And that's a lovely thing. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I was gonna, yeah, because because one of our things in college is like talk about like promoting yourself. And she actually showed us her resume and like a few people in class had never seen it. And they were like, you're in Hollyoaks, miss. So she was like, it was just, just people just searching up. Someone actually went on her eBay and searched up and she's, there's a few posters of her and we were just showing her, miss, look. And it's just, oh my God, it was the funniest thing. Cause I was like, <laughs> mm, I, I already knew all of this. I, I already knew all of this. What are you, what are you even see? So you, you've been under a rock or something, you know, I don't know. But yeah, yeah. So that was quite fun um i've just completely thought i was gonna say now i have to bear with it oh yes um the birthday wishes i completely forgot you're not on social media are you um mm. you you don't have you, the only thing i do on social media and it's kind of social media kind of not is cameo oh yeah cameo i'm on the cameo oh. app yeah someone convinced me and said deborah it's so much fun and it really is so uh, one of the games that i did last year that came out on Tuesday 2-22-22 um, was uh, Destiny 2 The Witch Queen. And I had no idea how popular the lore was, a 20 year lore of this character called Sabathun who has never been seen. And yeah. I am Sabathun and the reveal came on 2-22-22. And so all of a sudden, I started getting these massive amounts of requests and it was like, what's going on? And I had to ask someone who was a fan of the destiny franchise about it. And they're like, you have no idea who Sabathun is. You have no idea about this reveal. You have no idea how she's been talked about in the lore and her brother Oryx and her sister Zebu Arath. And I was like, I, I don't play video games. No. And it's so popular to this day that ever since before 2-22-22, when it was going to come out, and now people are still requesting um, cameos as Sabathun. Wow. Still, so a year cool. later, a year later after it came out. She's so beloved. She's beloved it by is, all. It is a, I, have no, I didn't realize how prolific this character was. Not me, but the character of Sabathun was, that people are still doing that. I've got cameos that I've got to do today, um, a number of them, for, you know, birthdays. And, and now that there is a new... Yeah episode coming out called Lightfall for Destiny 2. I'm sorry, just kicked my stand. Now okay. that there's a new okay. a, a new episode or installation of the game called Lightfall, now it's picking up again, there's resurgence. And they're like, can can Sabathun beg us to play? Or can Sabathun do this and can Sabathun? So um, would you mind having Sabathun say this or that or, you know? So it's a lot of that. Sometimes it's birthday stuff and um, other things, but yeah, Sabathun is still very popular. Believe yeah. it or not, yeah, Trouble. a year later, it was, and it's the only character that's been that popular that I've mm. ever um, voiced that's ever had that type of impact. It is the most impactful of all the video games that I've done. It is, bar none, by far, the most widely popular character that I've in thirty years that I've ever recorded. Thirty years that I've ever recorded. Have you ever had any Daisy Duck cameo requests yet? No. You know why? Because when you think of Daisy Duck and Mickey Mouse Funhouse, you think of Disney. You think, of, you think of Disney, you think of kids. Not just Tress McNeil, but you think of kids. Oh, so, right. So, you know, you know um, parents aren't doing that for birthdays. They're, they're hiring, you know, the performers and musicians and costumes and characters and cakes and, you know, all those kind of things. And so... That's not something, this is, Cameo seems to be primarily for adults. Uh, adults. Teenagers. A absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, and so Daisy Duck and any of the stuff that I've done, like um, Baby Shark's Big Show, where I'm Grandma Shark on the show, that's not something they would do here on Cameo. But video games, massive. And the series that I used to work on, it was a sketch comedy series here in LA called Mad TV. I'll still get stuff from Mad TV because I played Oprah and Whitney Houston and people remember that. And so I get, I'll get requests for them or characters that I've, other characters that I've done, but mostly it's video games. And mostly out of those video games, it's Sabathun from Destiny to the Witch Queen. Ooh, that's exciting. Speaking of popular characters or like ones that are your favorites, of course, we've got to talk about your Star Wars career. 
couldn't 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 pass it over, of course. Um, so Deborah, well, that's that's why don't you tell everybody about your dabble in the Star Wars world? What have you done? What video games? Oh, this is not just a dabble. I'm I'm in the universe. Let's dedicate uh, this section to Star Wars, yeah, of course, because we yeah, talk about Mark Hamill already. I'm Jenda in Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, and I reprise my role in Star Wars Jedi Survivor, which is coming out this year. And I've also played Tara Rashin. If you ever had the Oculus, there is an experience, an Oculus experience called Star Wars Tales from the Galaxy's Edge. And I play a, a villain and a rogue named Tara Rashin. Also in Star Wars The Last Jedi, um, I am a character called Nambigima. When Rey is on this, this desert planet and they're having a celebration, uh, 3PO is because he's human cyborg's relation and he can speak so many different languages, is interpreting from this little being who's asking Ray where she comes from, like who's, you know, what's her ancestry, her history, and she gives her these beads. And um, I am the voice of Nambihima in that. Wow. Yeah. So on, in, yeah, and I voiced a number of, of, of characters and background. I do a lot of ADR and looping for a lot of the Star Wars stuff films that came out like uh star wars a han solo story uh i have voices in that as well so i i'm kind of immersed in this the star wars galaxy and then marvel put out a five a five part comic book series on seer junda and there is now mm -hmm. a book coming out from what i heard uh about the history of, of Seer Junda and her adventures and who she is and so it's really wonderful that people are exploring this character beyond the video game and and delving and creating fan fiction into her past and into her future um yeah it's I'm very proud of that were you in the rise of Skywalker by any chance I do voices in the rise of Skywalker yes I did voices in the rise of Skywalker Ah, I see. So, like, all, a lot of the films then. Wow, that, that, must, that yeah. must be such a powerful thing to put on your resume, like, doing all these big films. And I don't really like have that. a resume. I, I, you know, I'm 60 years old now, so I really don't have a resume. I just, um, you know why? Because I've gotten to work so regularly, and the work has been steady, and it's only increased as I got older, that yeah. um, I, 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 I haven't used a resume in at least six, seven years. Close to mm -hmm. 10 years, actually, um, because the work that comes in with voiceover, people know my stuff. So sometimes they just bring me in. So for a lot of the loop groups, I've worked with so many of the directors and so many of the people involved in these loop groups that they like, Deborah would be right for this. Deborah would be right for this. Deborah would be right for this. Let's just bring her in. Hey, Deborah, we're looping here and we want you in this group. So a lot of those things or where it's voice replacement, a lot of people already know what I do at this age. Um, mm -hmm. And I have enough work under my belt and work still coming in and a lot of video game work that people know me so a lot of times it's a matter of we're just going to bring you in for this we're going to bring you in for this we're going to bring you in for this and other things that i still have to audition for that are huge roles you know because i also do a lot of performance capture i'm working on a project now that requires performance capture meaning the suit and everything else and even when i oh, did wow. amanda waller I went over to the UK to Rocksteady, their company, so that they can. Oh, yeah, because they're based in face. London, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. They scanned my face and they scanned my body. And then when I went back to LA and I began the role, I did the performance with my vocal cords, with voiceover. And then in the UK, they had somebody else do the motion capture of my body. So as they're listening to my voice, they're using their body along yeah. with my voice to be yeah. Amanda Waller instead of flying That's me back so over to do that, funny. which is smart. It makes sense. Sorry, just shutting my blinds. It's literally, it just goes dark within the space of an hour in the UK. It's crazy. Okay. Yeah. You probably, you probably could, uh, when, when you came, uh, when did you, when did you, uh, when did you come to London, may I ask? That was at least four years ago. I, I was there twice uh, to render and do the performance capture. Once it was, again, to record some of the lines, and that's when it was experimental to make sure that they can get the look of Amanda Waller the way they wanted. Um, yeah. And so they did the facial capture, they did the body capture, and then the next time I went over, I did the very first scene. Wow. In the game. The very first cinematic. 
in the game. And then after that, I didn't need to come back anymore because they're like, we're going to capture the performance with your voice. And then we're going to have somebody come in and do the body movement. Wow. So in the UK, it's my voice, but it's somebody moving their body to my voice. It's a British person. <laughs> Absolutely. It's British, yeah. Um, but it's because... really cool that they made Amanda Waller look like me because there are some games that look exactly like me. I think this is my fourth game. It's like an homage. It really is, and it's I'm humbled and I'm grateful. Um, Amanda Waller looks like me. Sir Junda looks like me. I had a role in, in a video game... Um, a uh, character named Grace Walker, mm -hmm. the big Afro, yeah, that looks like me, in Wolfenstein: wow. The New Colossus, and mm -hmm. then again in Wolfenstein: Young Blood. Different hair, but still me. So they, they, I've looked like me in four games, five games actually in Call of Duty: Modern wow. Warfare. They made it look like me as well. They, it, in fact, that was the rendering that was so close to me that I thought it was a film. I was like, that's not motion capture. That's a movie. That's how do they get that? Because it was so, so absolutely me without this, without this and with hair as a military general, I played General Lyons that it looked so much like me that I thought it was me in a movie. And it was like, yeah, the, the graphics were genius. The HD quality, the, it was the high, it was the highest definition I'd ever seen in a video game to date. And so I've had, yeah, five times in which uh, I was rendered to look like me. And the game that I'm doing now was not supposed to look like me at all. It was not me at all. But mm -hmm. the performance that I'm bringing to it as we continue to move forward, they were like, we needed to look like you. Your body, because we're listening to you and we're looking at you because that's performance capture as well. And they said, it just has to be it has to look like you. It just everything that you're bringing with your body and your emotions and your face is this has to look like you. So the character was originally Caucasian. Mm -hmm. um, the character was originally Caucasian and they said, no, it has to look like you. So now they're making it look like me. That's cool. That is so yeah. cool. Wow. You're going to have to come back to England definitely for a cover. Do you do, you do conventions actually? I would. I do. Um, the reason I, I was always hesitant is because I don't like selling things. I don't like that. Here's a picture. It's 20 bucks. And I, 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 it's always made me uncomfortable. Why? Because if someone stopped me in the street, I would talk to them. And if they said, would you sign this for me? I would. And they said, you'd take a picture. I would. So if I'm giving it to free for free, why would I then go to a convention and tell you to pay for it? It just feels awkward to me and uncomfortable. And I also don't want to disrespect the people who that is supplemental to their income or that is their income. Yeah. You know, they should be able to do that. And I don't want anyone to go, wait a minute. Why are you charging when she doesn't? I'm not going to pay for that. Or, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, Deborah's not charging. Um, it's not fair to, to someone else's business. So that's my main reason. And so I'm doing conventions now because in um, our understanding of it, it's like I'm not going to sell anything, but I will do an area for Q&A. And I will do an area for meet and greet. And if there is a panel, I'll either moderate the panel or I will be on the panel. See, then I can participate at that without feeling like I have to sell something at the end. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's always been how I participate because the way I want to participate is not necessarily all the ways that a convention works. And so I've always avoided conventions that way. But um, I'm I've, I'm now teaching at conventions or coaching at conventions. I'm keynote speaker at conventions or one convention yeah. coming up in Atlanta, Georgia. And at another one, I'm participating by doing like a meet and greet and a Q&A or a panel um, in Brooklyn, New York. And I'm from Queens, New York. So I'll be going home to see family when I do that as well. It's exciting. and Because uh, yeah. I've just remembered, I remember watching you on a virtual panel that you did. And it was a Mark Evanier's Cartoon Voices panel. I was gonna say, yeah, because because I've I've worked with Mark a few times. And like, you know, he's told me all about his panels. And just seeing all these people he's got on his panels, it's yeah. like wow like just wow okay i am yeah. like i am 
so impressed like it's like it's like it kind of connects you know but honestly all in all the way how you've explained like you want to get people to pay for your stuff that is beautiful and honestly i would do the same thing because my parents agree it's the fans that made these people famous big and you know it comes to see them at conventions i mean when i tried to, when i met frank um that like they tried to overcharge me at the convention and just you know just it's just they put up the prices on the day and it's just they won't they wouldn't even let you in the queue unless you're prepaid for his autograph so i couldn't even i couldn't even go up and say hi or anything to him so i and who I, was this frank welker wow yeah they were like oh yeah uh, uh you'll have to wait on the other side of the barrier and it when it with when the queue there's no one in the queue you can come and say hi so i would but then 10 seconds later someone would show up with a prepaid autograph they say sorry you're gonna have to clear out now sorry i'm like i go to these conventions yeah. to meet people and talk to them and stuff i don't go to get autographs i'm not an autograph person i do get autographs but they're in, like very rare occasions like mm -hmm. i'm more of a photo person as you can see yeah <laughs> Mm -hmm. I prefer photos over um, autographs. So at least I did get to spend uh, a, a time with Frank at uh, the Comic Con because I know we did like a panel and stuff. And bless him, at the end of his uh, script reading, he actually gave me a signed script. The, the, the script he has in his pocket. He's a lovely man. I was like, oh my gosh. And like, we fell out of touch because obviously he's not on any social media and like, I don't have any direct contact with him. So like, I don't hear from him very often. So it is hard to sort of reach him sometimes. So the next time I talk to him will probably be the next time he does a UK appearance this year. So yeah, that's that's that's, that's very exciting. Um, But yes. what, I, what, what my, my main question was like, you should come back to England, not like for a convention, but just like in general, would, would you do that? <laughs> Oh yeah, my my because I I have family there. I really have, yeah. My ex husband and I are best friends, so his son is still like my son, and we're really close. And he still sees me as a mother figure in his life. That's never going to change. Oh. I love him and love him madly. Um, and he works in the entertainment industry over there, even though he's Canadian. Uh -huh. He's from Canada and he works in the UK and he's right now in between that space of I've been doing this, but I really want to try this. And so I'm just going to figure out where I want to be um, yeah. here. But I think he's going to stay there for a while. And so I would go over to see him and I would and then see you, of course. But it's, it's, it's going to take a minute because I'm working all the time. I'm working on projects all the time. They keep coming in. And when I'm not working on projects, it's those auditions. And when I'm not working on projects, it's just taking care of my home. And, and the animals. You know, and my animals and um, and doing the cameos. So it's just yeah. been a busy time for me. It's been a, and I also do television shows where, uh, uh, where I'm like the game announcer. Like there's a show called The Weakest Link, which was a UK show that made into an yep. American show. With and Adam Robinson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it became popular again here. So it was brought back. And yeah. I'm the game show announcer on that one. And we really? just think where, yeah, it's called, the, and it is the weakest link. It's hosted by Jane Lynch. And so wow. uh, we're finishing up our third season. That I record from my bedroom. Really? Wow. Yes. And there's an actor comedian, or mostly a, a stand up comedian named Steve Harvey. And, oh, Steve Harvey. That okay. He's got a judge show now where he uh -huh. rules over court cases called Judge Steve Harvey. And I am the- Oh, so it's like George uh, Judy, but with Steve Harvey. Yes. Oh, and I right. am the court announcer on that show. It's all uh, wow. pre-recorded. So I am the off-camera uh, court announcer on that show. And I record that from the bedroom. So we just wow. finished that, but we're still going back into the weakest link and another Mickey Mouse special starting tomorrow that I'm going oh, to record. My so my, my week, you know, when I look at my book of this year alone, it's just, I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll, you know, it started out like this, as you can go, okay, this was the week of December. Here yeah. it is going into the week of January. And you can see it starts filling out again. Oh my God. Oh my, oh, oh my. So all of this word. is where we are right now. Oh my gosh. Do you ever get a chance to, to sit down by any chance? Um, I do. I do. My keister needs it, <laughs> you know, and so... You know, and I'm working on, I also work on American Dad every once in a while. So I'm coming back up to that and, ta yeah, and I just booked another video game. And I so, it's, yeah, yeah. So I do American Dad and um, voices for that show every once in a while. And 
and some other cartoons. I do voices on those, uh, one called Hamster and Gretel, uh, where I go in and do voices on Hamster and Gretel. And there's one on Netflix called Oddballs. And I do, you know, voices oh, yeah. on Oddballs. And uh, there's one also on Netflix that we finished. I don't think, I don't know if it's coming back for another season. I don't think so. It's called Dogs in Space. And I had uh, two characters, three characters on that. So when I'm not, and there's another one that I can't talk about that's coming out that's preschool, but Star Wars oriented. And I've done a guest voice on that. So, you know, and there's another one that Star Trek oriented that I do voices on that. So a lot of times people will say, well, I'm not a main character, but we want you to do all these fill-in voices because they know I do preachers. They know I do babies and kids and all these sort of things. So when I'm not working on a show where I am Daisy Duck or I am specifically a, a, a character within them, they'll say, oh, come do the background stuff. And I'll be like, sure, okay. Okay, this show and this show and this show and this show. So I end up working a lot because of that because it's, it's a scale of so many different types of things. It's a plethora. You know, I do ADR. Um, and, and looping. Um, I do uh, books on tape, but that's rare because that takes a little more time than than the other stuff that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, I do narration for documentaries. I do scratch tracks. Scratch track is when they know you're going to hire someone famous to do this, but we want a voice so that as we're putting this uh, together, we want to know the the feel that we're going with. We want yeah. it to feel like, okay, we know where we're going with this. And then once we know what we're going with was, and it's everything we want it to be, we're going to take your voice out and bring in, you know, the person we want. So I do yeah. scratch tracks too. I've nice. done two Disney narration scratch tracks. One went to Meghan Markle and the other one went to Angela Bassett, but they wanted that energy. And it's a lot of work. You know, because you're you're doing it as if you are the voice of that narration, that you are the voice of that documentary. And then they take your voice out so that the other person who comes in can get a feel for what the director wants. Yeah, yeah. May I ask what those projects were that you got um uh Ang Angela and Megan did the thing? I know Angela from uh yes. 911, the the TV show, and she was Angela also Bassett, in the uh, yes. Transformers Bumblebee film, yeah. And of course, but Megan she was Marcus also was... in Wakanda Forever. She played T'Challa's mother in Wakanda. <gasps> oh, yeah, um... yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Have you that. ever seen? Now, do you know the the singer? Um... It's gonna drive me crazy. She did the biopic, and she was brilliant. Um. And again, I have short-term memory loss. Okay. Angela Bassett was... She did a film called What's Love Got to Do With It? Okay. What's Love Got to Do With It? I'm a fast typer. Tina okay. Turner. Yes, she played Tina Turner in What's Love Got to Do With It? And she was brilliant. Yeah, I was thinking of singing in my head. I was like, no, it can't be Rihanna. It can't be Beyonce. Well, Tina yeah, Turner, do you, maybe? You know Tina like, Turner oh, is? Well, of course I do, you know do yeah. Okay. So I sing a little like Tina Turner too. I can make my voice sound a little like Tina Turner when she sings. Really? So, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So Angela Bassett was in that. So anyway, she was, uh, so I did the, the track for Good Night Oppie, O-P-P-Y, Good Night Oppie. And that's a Disney, that is a Disney um, documentary. And the other Disney documentary was with Meghan Markle was about elephants. Oh yeah, that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did the scratch track for that. And it's a lot of work because you're doing it as if you are the voice and then they replace your voice. So you're putting all your emotion and energy into it so that when they come in, again, at the end of the day, like I said, they don't want to hear you, they want to feel you. So when they come in, they're inspired by what the feeling they want for the pieces, not just the sound of the voice. Yeah, Angela Bassett probably said, oh my gosh, I get to copy Deborah Wilson. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> she was probably more on a talk with you. Like, she was probably more excited to work with you. <laughs> like, it's just... No, she's brilliant. She's amazing. But yeah, yeah so I, I mean, I do a lot. And because I do a lot of different things in voiceover and performance capture, it just keeps me busy. So the UK is a dream, is on my vision board and dream board. But the reality right now is I have so much work coming up that, you know, and projects coming up because now, again, now video games are doing seasons. 
So it's this yeah. episode, this prolific episode, this prolific episode. And the one that I was just re recently cast in is as one of the leads. So it's going to be quite a bit of work if if they can pull it off, you know, from episode to episode and see how well the game does. You know, because there are some games that come out and it's like, no, nah, it didn't do well. The audience is not going for this. And there are other games that take off, like I, where I've done one episode, but it, the character is so prolific that the character lives on beyond yeah. what I've done. And that was um, uh, Destiny 2, The Witch Queen. Of course, of course. Because yep. I think she, she perishes. She perishes in the game. But oh, um, yeah, mm -hmm. but it was it was beautiful. It was a beautiful death. <laughs> yeah, you got to go out in style. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, about the lead video game that you said about, um, I'm thinking of obviously, do, well, obviously, um, doing like a part two interview with you in the future. Maybe we can yes. do it in the summer and then we can talk about it then. We could talk about Kill the Justice League as well. We can yeah, yeah. Definitely things. Kill the Justice League and Star Wars Jedi Survivor because by that time, by, by June, they should be out. Yeah, they should be yeah. out. It yeah. is really, um, it was a really emotional, massive undertaking. And on top of that, it ups the stakes. If you didn't play the first game, if you play the first game it and the intensity has been upped a thousand times the the gameplay has been ramped up a thousand times in the second game the the emotional intensity the storyline intensity has been ramped up a thousand times from the first game it's prolific wow this that franchise uh will never die <laughs> i i really believe that it will have um cameron manahan cameron monahan will have um i really believe that because he does on camera, he's really an on camera actor. In fact, he played on the Fox Network series um, Gotham. He played the Joker. He played the Joker, yeah. <laughs> and he's actually appearing, or he appeared, I can't remember, at Comic Con Northern Ireland uh, in over here. Like, you know, yeah. So I hope he does, I hope he does a confession because I'm trying to like, meet all these Joker actors and it's just so cool, you know. Um, yeah. Also, Deborah. Can I just quickly apologize if, like, every time you talk about something, I like say something about myself? Because you I've have had no apologies. Ah, no apologies. This is a flow, a conversation. I know. Never apologize for being you. This is just the way we're supposed to have this. This is you have to accept and embrace this. I do. This is this is the way we're supposed to go. This is the way it's supposed to go. Oh, everybody, no, like, everybody, <laughs> and every interview is different. Everybody's interview style is different. Yours is conversational, and I dig it because even if there wasn't camera rolling, I would still enjoy it equally as much because it's about getting to know you, not just being interviewed yeah. by you. Oh, thank you, Deborah. I was gonna say because um, one of my because I remember like I received comments like in the past saying like you know I focus too much on herself and like a, a, one of my recipients actually said the other day like I thought our oh, interview you focus too much on yourself. I'm like I love uh, that you focus on yourself because that helps that me get to know you. And when I get to know you, I feel more comfortable to have a conversation with you as opposed to, because uh, I do a lot of interviews, I do a lot of podcasts. I bet, I I bet you do, you, yeah. And it's like, you know, ask me question, a question, answer. I answer. Question, ask me answer. A question, I answer. And so it's really nice because I get a, 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 to know a people a bit because they're asking these questions and I get a chance to know their energy more than them. But um, having this is like talking talking to a friend I haven't spoken to in a long time and we're just sharing the things we're geeked out about you know it's like getting yeah. on the phone and going oh my god blah 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 and, it, oh, and I love about? that I love this because it's just us having a conversation it's just us two having a conversation you talk about this and I hear about you and life and then you do the dinner and so this is this is the way it's meant to be and I love it it's different it's it's us just having a conversation and you know what your fans and everyone who's listening gets an opportunity to listen in on something that's private and personal and they get a chance to be a part of that as opposed oh, yeah. to, I know it's a podcast and I know this and she's going to ask questions and Deborah's going to answer. That's so obvious. What's beautiful about this is it's like a flower that just unfolds and they get a chance to be a part of it. You know, it's our exactly. private conversation. It's our girl time. And yeah. then someone else gets a chance to listen. So I love the way exactly. this is going. Thank you, Deborah. I appreciate that. It's like with my podcast, I know, like, you know, when I listen to other people's podcasts, it's like I'm just sitting on the side and I'm just watching like the match go ahead. But like, 
when it on my show, it's the match going ahead, but the person is also playing in the match. Then, like, it's like we're, we're all talking in one big conversation, and it's like absolutely it's like natural. Or, and, and it's like at a party, and someone listens in, and just yeah. you know, they don't say anything, oh, but yeah, they're now like, they're joining. Yeah, yeah, we see yeah. them there, and we're just yeah. like talking. And- exactly yeah that's that's what sort of like that's that's what stands out for me and uh you know talking to all these voice actors as i said before about my socialization skills it's just it it, it boosts my confidence it boosts my my enthusiasm my desire to continue with voiceover because i'm a voiceover actress myself i've done a few uh, jobs um so it's been really fun and i did a theme park in uh, california uh i did i did lines for that uh the last year and it's opening next year and that's why i'm what is it going. what are we doing uh it's a it's a it's a dark ride in uh, california uh, it's not at any theme park it's just you know just there i suppose i don't know what the what plans do you mean are. a dark ride uh like uh, it's hard to explain like uh basically like it's a small world but not water-based um but and it's mainly like you know like a story it's like a, a roller co- like like a ghost train but not scary wow and wait for disneyland no in it's anaheim like, or disney world in orlando florida none of none of them none of them it's not a disney ride it's a um i don't know what it is to be i don't know what the plans are for it but it's just a dark ride that will be licensed out to different brands if like someone from someone could from disney could notice it and and, and pitch it to disney or something or like not very farm or like six flags i don't know but um i did four characters okay. for that and it is the main ride is located somewhere in california so we did those four characters and it's opening next year and that's partially well when i say partially it's half and half 50 percent to go see the ride 50 percent to come see all my friends in los angeles okay and will you please keep me informed where and when because i want to be able if it's in california there's no reason for me not to go depending upon where it is in california yeah of course of course you know keep you updated so i can videotape me out on your ride oh (laughs) fun yeah yeah like ah look at this um, I'll, I'll do the same thing when i go to disneyland i'll be like hey never look it's you <laughs> and it's just, it's just like, what a show and it's really cool honestly um to do that and sorry my brain's just frazzled now because i've literally just spent talked all of that and my cheeks are still hurting. i'm <laughs> smiling so i'm like oh what do i do now <laughs> um so i thought we could round off this interview with one final subject um well, mm-hmm. part part one obviously rhapsody street kids believe in santa if you don't mind talking about it that is i did that so long ago and you know who else was also in that who mark hamill, mark hamill. yes of course the, the biggest comments on that online on youtube was that it was so stupid it made no sense it was so poorly done and um i would say that the quality is not the quality of the stuff you see today. The the motion, the animation was off. It was rudimentary animation. It's the difference between playing Pong beep, 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 and the video games today. And um, the movement, the background, all of it was rudimentary animation on somebody's computer. Yeah. And that's what they wanted for grandma, someone who stutters, but only her grandson can hear, kind of make sense of it. Yeah. And there are there are so many things on YouTube that make fun of that. So it was popular enough as one of the worst animated Christmas specials Special. ever to, to have a life. It has a life in that realm. You know, it could have died and gone away. But it still Someone has a life as one of the worst animated Christmas specials, and Mark Hamill was in it as well. Apparently, like he recorded, the, everyone in the special recorded their dialogue, obviously because everyone does it like before the animation's done, and you weren't aware of what it was going to look like until the actual thing came out on was screened on TV, and it was only screened once, if I remember correctly. Was it? Was yeah, it a few times. That's even a surprise that it was once. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, of course, with great grandma Fran, people said her story was down to an audio error. Maybe like, yeah, just the lines were getting messed up in the editing and stuff. But you can definitely confirm that is actually how you did it in the recording. <laughs> Christmas. Wow. Christmas. <laughs> We, I'm not talking to anyone in particular. We have just watched history in the making. We have just debunked a rumour. That is not down to the audience. Let fans. your fans you. know, fan girl, that was oh. for you. I will only perform that for you. Let your fans know, fan girl. Spread the truth. Be I'm the truth. The fact finder and the truth teller. I will. I will, cause cause someone did say that you confirmed in an interview that it was all you. I was like, hmm. I still they wanted that. They wanted Grandma to to seem like she was muddled and befuddled, and that she didn't make any sense. But she was the one that made all the sense when she did have to say a word or two. That it was all yeah. about Christmas and how the grandson understood the muddledness. Yeah. Where his parents were. Who I was going to say, because it was the, uh, one of the Power Rangers was the grandson, wasn't he? Walter S. Jones, I think. I can't. Which Power Ranger yeah. was he? Was it, it was, it was I one have of the no Power... idea. It was one of the Power at the Rangers. Time, it, at the time, it was one of those a animations. It was one of, the, one of the first things I did in terms of an animated um, special. So that's, yeah. that's at the Walter beginning. So the baby steps of voiceover for me in that regard. And the baby step in voiceover for video game for me was Hot Shots Call 4. Yeah. And that was the very first video game I ever did, Hot Shots Call 4. Wow. That's and so I just, cool. yeah. It was a Japanese game. And I, <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. Like, so, so you redubbed that then? Or was that like... Was it made in Japan or did you like read up the original? No, I, I, no, I it wasn't dubbed. It was it was a Japanese company that made the game. Oh, right. OK. However, yeah, I recorded it here. Oh, um, that so was my cool. very first video game. That was my very, very first video game. And some wow. and there are few people that are fans of my work or know my work that know that very few. But there are some and they were like, what? Because I had a cameo from someone who was like, tell me about that. And the reason he wanted to know, and it's interesting because he was very polite about it, but I knew the the it was very stereotypical for what I did for that character. Her name was Bertha. And it was very black stereotypical, every type of stereotypical kind of thing. Big fat black woman with big afro, big breasts, heavy. And um, when I, I said, you know what, I've never seen the game. I don't recall. And then I found it online. And I watched all her stuff and I went, wow, that's how you live and you learn. Yeah. That's how you live and you learn. That's how you take those steps and you live and you learn. You go, wow, would I do that again? Well, I did play someone with an Afro who was a revolutionary. But by that time, I had really honed in on the characters I wanted to create as opposed to someone saying that this is what this is and do it this way. Or can you do it this way? And you go, sure, because it was my first game. You know, mm. I wasn't thinking stereotype. Yeah. I was thinking, oh, you want to like this? I can do that. I'm black. I can do that. That's all I was thinking at the time. So I didn't know anything about the game and I didn't know anything about it. it for me, it was a voiceover in a video game, a video game, a video game. Wow, I'm going to be in a video game. That's all I was thinking. I had no idea. So it was like, oh, you want to like this? I can do that. And it was for yeah. me, it was like easy street. This is going to be fun. This is easy street. Um, And when I saw it, it was like, Okay. <laughs> All right, you live and you learn. That was my step into, you know, that was my first step through the fresh threshold. But at, when I crossed that threshold, I got a chance to choose um, the way I wanted to represent what I do and who I am. Yeah. Know? Yeah, of course. I'm still, well, and you know what? There isn't anything that I've done that I have that I'm proud of. 
because everything is a step. So I take pride in knowing that um, good, bad, right or wrong, it is a step in, in the direction of me. Mm -hmm. I will always be proud of it. People are like, are you ashamed of that? Nope. Grandma stuff? Nope. I'll always be proud of it because it was a step in the direction of me. Of course. Of course. Just be proud of what you've done. This this line of work that you've got on your belt. They'll, there will never be another Deborah Wilson. They probably may, no. they, 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 will, they never will. Who's done Rhapsody Street Kids, Mad TV, Star Wars, um, Suicide Squad. Like, just, just got like under your belt is just oh my gosh like I'm everything grateful. everything a woman could have ever wanted wanted yeah i'm living mm -hmm. i'm living my dream at this age and i'm 60 and as i get older i'll be 61 this year in april Ooh. i'll be 61 and as i get older the work keeps coming in because no one cares about my age or my race it's just a matter of can you pull and as i grow my wisdom and grow my age i bring more to the work I bring more to the table. I bring more to the voiceover. I bring more to the performance capture. I bring more to the narration. I bring more to the storytelling because of my own wisdom. And so that's why I'm working more as I get older. You'll have to put me in the grave the day after I finish a project. I will not stop. You will have to put me in the grave the day after I finish a project. Go, go out in style, as I said. Like, I think like what a really cool thing is, I can't remember where I heard this idea. Someone said, like, why don't you put someone's ashes in a firework and you let it off and it just goes poof, and just like everywhere. It's like, okay, that would that that would be cool, but like that would be very cool. Mine would have to be a yellow firework because yellow is my favorite color. Okay. It's like yellow sparkles and stuff like that. Anything yellow I blue. like. Blue you like blue. Well, I'm glad oh. I'm wearing this shirt then. Blue is the throat chakra. Blue is the color of the throat chakra. Blue is a very powerful color for me. Nice. You know, it's the color of of your vo your 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 throat chakra because it's it's your truth. It's your um, speaking your truth, living your truth, um, and whatever you choose to do with your voice, speaking for love, speaking out for others, speaking for truth and justice, speaking in characters to create um, a voice for someone's. Uh, narrative, you know, narrative uh, in a video game or narrative in an animated show or narrative in a documentary or narrative. It's it's being able to storyteller. So blue is the, the chakra of the throat because it's not only you telling the story of, of whatever you're working on, it's you telling your truth and living your truth and speaking out for others, speaking out for other communities and speaking out for animals that don't have a voice um, or don't have a voice like we do to communicate. So like this, being able to speak that truth and yeah. reminding people that, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Everything is a step in a direction towards you. And speaking of animals who, um, who, who like, uh, can't really say, like, dialogue, but we still can understand them. I want to quickly, I know I said Rhapsody Street Kids would be the last subject, but I've got to throw this into good measure. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Curious George, your time on uh, Curious George show. There were different um, little characters that I did. They weren't... Um, um, they were what we call interstitial characters. An interstitial character means you come in for an episode and you, you play this character and just for that episode. Yeah. And you come in and play that character just for that episode. And the very first time I did Curious George, it was as an 11 year old girl. And the other person who auditioned was an 11 year old girl. And I was looking at the oh, role of an no. 11 year old girl. <laughs> Over an 11 year old girl. <laughs> well, that, happens. that was the just first time. And then, there, like I said, various characters here and there. So I wasn't on the series regularly, as prolific and as long as it was. But I had, whenever they wanted other characters, they would just bring me in, which was really lovely to be able to go that, you know. And like American Dad, when they're looking for little characters here and there, you know, interstitial characters, they bring me in, you know. And so there are many shows that I work on where they just bring me in for ver various characters instead of me having to audition for them. For some certain things, they will. And for certain things I audition for, like I do a lot of The Loud House. And for the bigger characters, I audition oh, yeah. for. And they brought me in for Wee Baby Bears. And, uh, and there are a lot of things that I audition for. And some of those things. And once they know your voice, they know what you can do. They just go, oh, you know what? That's two lines. Let's bring Deborah in. And it's great because I'm like, I don't have to audition. And you automatically trust my work. And thank you. It's a, an honor that you trust my work enough to know that I can bring in two lines and make them exactly what they need to be, you know, and fit your story and fit your narrative, you know, and not stand out, but blend in perfectly to the story. So 
it's an honor to be to be have two lines because you can do a lot with those two lines as opposed to it's only two lines no no it's two lines okay let me make sure that i bring everything and i bring a thousand percent to those two lines as i do with anything i'm doing where it's a th thousand lines you have two lines or two thousand lines it'll be the same energy and the same work ethic always 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 and that's why i know that you know you're going to have to bury me the day after I finish a project because I'm going to work up until the, I, I, that's my goal is to work up until the day I die. Mine too. And stay but healthy. Just, I mean, just you know, I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty strong for someone who's 60 and I'm, I'm going to be 61. So <laughs> you go girl. Yeah. Thank you. Goddess. You're welcome. You're so welcome, Deborah. Thank you again. I know I've said thank you, but you deserve all the thank yous in the world for talking to me. This has been one of the best chats I've had in a while. And to talk to you has just been so much fun. I loved talking to you. I loved every minute of this. To you at home, thank you so much for watching this episode of In Conversation with ATF. Stay safe, stay happy, and thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Cut.